good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back here at the public forum at the exhibition Hydrogen and Fuel Cells Europe here at the Hannover Messe 2022. I will welcome you here at the public forum. You may have a seat. We have complimentary drinks. It's all at the house. This is the last talk for today and I'm actually quite happy. I prepared a little introduction. I wanted to sing, but my singing is really bad, so I wanted to say, let's get political, because we are going to talk a little bit more about politics. Um, so um, we have a title that is Policy and Regulatory, Regulatory Challenges to Renewable, Renewable Hydrogen Uptake. For that, please welcome with me on stage Director for Market Development and Public Affairs from Nell Hydrogen is Mr. Thorsten Herbert. Now I know why you said I should make a dance <laughs> to stage, yes. because, because you were singing, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, let's skip the singing, we want to talk about serious <laughs> topics today, and um, I'm, I'm actually happy to have you here. You are here um, from Nell Hydrogen, which is an electrolyzer company, uh, we have had already some discussions And the fueling, here. hydrogen fueling station. And yeah. the fueling stations, yes, uh, but we are here to talk about something that is needed to talk about and you are willing to talk about and I'm, I'm actually happy that you're sharing so much inside information so um, first of all what do we want to talk about today yeah actually kind of the red thread uh, I think what you what you can expect is we can actually start with saying the regulatory for framework the regulatory framework for hydrogen in Europe doesn't exist so there is no regulatory framework for hydrogen in Europe yet so we were living in pilot projects demo projects we were living uh, from analogies with natural gas um, but we don't have a regulatory framework for hydrogen in the energy system as a fuel as a feedstock for chemicals um, and also as a future substitute for, for natural gas in the natural gas pipelines. Uh, and the good news is um, the European Commission now started the process to exactly establish this framework. Uh, and this is kind of addressing all of us because we have to help the politicians to implement it in a yeah, practically feasible way, right? So that it doesn't stand in our way in the realization, but uh, that, yeah, it's, it's kind of pragmatic and, and practical uh, to, to implement. Before we talk about the details on the European regulatory frameworks, um, why is it so important to have a framework on regulations regarding hydrogen developments? Where shall I start? Um, <laughs> Um, it's, it's really about, yeah, as I said, a, a, a new element in the energy system. So there is, like, you find regulations for liquid fuels as we use them today all over the place, but there's nothing in place for hydrogen. So how is hydrogen handled as a fuel? How is it accounted with regards to taxes, for example? Um, um, how is hydrogen handled in the natural gas network networks in future? Um, um, how um, another like important one is um, how is the definition of green renewable hydrogen? What is the CO2 footprint of other types of hydrogen? What is the methodolo methodology to actually? Uh, calculate the CO2 footprint uh, of, of, these, of these other um, production methods. It is it's like really, um, yep. as I said before, there is nothing in place um, and it's like we are, and the rest is like established yeah. uh, things like natural gas, like liquid fuels as we know them today and like, uh, yeah, the power grid and everything connected to that. 
Yeah, and it's so important that um, we address all these questions that we have regarding the hydrogen development. Um, as, and we are happy, actually, that the polit politics are now having a look, a deeper look, and um, respecting hydrogen. Um, so you are an expert um, when it comes to public affairs, but also when it comes to the political framework. So you said, so they, currently there is no political framework. Is there anything that the European Union is planning to do? Yeah, yeah indeed. That's, that's, I think that's the, the good news that this started now. Uh, and like, the thing is, like, with the, the so-called Fit for 55 package, um, where like it that concerns like about 12 regulatory processes like 12 directives or regulations um, and there like at every part of it uh, it it there's something concerning hydrogen so what, so, what is the fit for 55 package um, it's kind of a package of legislations legislative processes um, and, and the name indicates like which is supposed to make Europe fit for 55% CO2 reduction in 2030. Um, yeah, and it concerns like the whole, let's say, energy system. And that also, since the significance of hydrogen, when it comes to being fit for 55% CO2 reduction, since the significance of hydrogen has been acknowledged, um, like a lot of um, uh, these legislations are also um, yeah, concerning hydrogen. Um, there, there's one like, very prominent one, uh, for example, uh, as part of this package, is, is, it's also part of the Renewable Energy Directive, um, where, let's say, the, the Commission has the challenge to make sure that the target of decarbonizing the power grid with building up renewables like wind and solar. So this is like one really overarching target, like decarbonizing the grid. But at the same time, we say we need green hydrogen for like transport, industry and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and that means if you take renewable energy, which is supposed to decarbonize the grid, and produce green hydrogen, you actually um, 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 postpone, let's say, the, 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 the success in the target of, of like decarbonizing the grid. So, and that, that's kind of one of the challenges the, 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 the legislators have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How do we make sure that the decarbonization of the grid is successful, but at the same time, not uh, kind of um, 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 yeah, hindering uh, the renewable hydrogen sector to grow. Um, and then this is like one, like just one example and one small part of these, this, this so-called Fit for 55 package, yeah. uh, where, like, which is a, a big challenge and where we are trying to help uh, the, the politicians uh, to make this feasible and to make sure that uh, uh, not one target is um, uh, compromised more than the other. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, by the way, if you have a question, you can ask that question. Um, this is a public forum, so yes, you are invited also to, to address your questions here to Torsten. Uh, if you raise your hand, I can come down to you. Just let me know when is a... Yeah, I have a first question. Um, I will take it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Tyler Kimbrell. Um, could you comment on the EU making a directive and then that translating to actual the participating countries passing legislation to make that happen? Like, do you see that as a, oh, sorry, as a hindrance to adoption of hydrogen or delay in, in the growth of that market based on that? Yeah, basically all the political processes are kind of tiring and like long, right? So I think that's a general characteristic of legislative processes uh, involving all the parties, um, especially on European level. Uh, and you're right, there's a, there are like two types of um, legislative tools the, the European Commission has. These are the directives, 
um, which means, like kind of implied in the world, uh, it's kind of giving, giving a direction to the member states. And then it's on the member states to uh, implement that on a national level. So that's, that's the directive. And then you have the regulation, which is actually going through directly. So this needs to be kind of fulfilled by uh, the, the member states directly. Uh, there's, there's a nice example for that. Um, the, the whole topic about alternative fuels. Uh, so currently we have the alternative fuels infrastructure directive, which is kind of laying out targets for alternative fuels infrastructure, which includes hydrogen, uh, but also like charging stations and uh, natural gas. Um, and part of the Fit for 55 package is transforming that directive into a regulation, uh, which means, and uh, like the proposal of the Commission was, um, uh, um, having a hydrogen station every 150 kilometer um, at the main European corridors, uh, which would be significant, and also like all these stations should be able also to, fulf uh, to fill heavy-duty station, uh, heavy-duty ve vehicles, like a minimum capacity of two tons uh, per day. Um, yeah, and, and yeah, that is one example. Like if that would be a regulation, every member, states, member state needs to make sure that every 150 kilometer uh, you find a hydrogen refueling station with your truck or your car. Another question from my side. In Europe, we have uh, experienced increasing um, energy prices, especially when it comes to um, power. And um, also the recent development of the war in Ukraine, Ukraine has shown a certain dependency on um, gas from Russia. Do you think that the European Union uh, is now acting um, and helping the hydrogen business more than ever due to the recent development? Uh, absolutely. So, um, yeah, as sad as like the things are that, that are happening in, in, in Ukraine, um, actually what we see is um, that like they, the, 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 the more severe the crisis is, hydrogen is becoming stronger. Um, and, and this is like just another like proof for that. Um, with, let's say, the, the war happening, um, the Commission even increased the targets for hydrogen uh, in, in, in the Union um, in the so-called Repower EU plan, um, which, like, the communication to that came out shortly after the attack. Uh, but now, like, only two weeks ago, uh, the Commission presented the plan, like, what are the actual measures to achieve that? Please share some for, for those who don't know and, and any information from the Repower EU plan. I think it's really yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. so the, the, like the key targets um, with regards to hydrogen are uh, that the EU um, sees a demand um, also motivated through like becoming independent from Russian gas, uh, sees a demand for, for hydrogen of uh, 10 million tons uh, produced domestically and another 10 million tons being imported. Um, so an overall amount of 20 million tons, um, which would mean, like, if you just look to the, to the, to the 10 million tons, um, we talk about, you can calculate back and forth, but to produce these 10 million tons domestically, you land like, yeah, depending on how you calculate, between two and 300 gigawatt installed electrolyzer capacity. Is the industry ready for this? That's exactly, and that's like also now concerning Nell, uh, obviously, as, a, as the world leading electrolyzer manufacturer, um, that this is immense, right? So we're talking 2030, this is like eight years mm -hmm, from now, mm -hmm. not, not even. Um, and uh, yeah, now also like, obviously we are making the point, if you look over the thumb, we, today we have a yearly 
manufacturing capacity, like all the electrolyzer manufacturers together, we have a yearly manufacturing capacity of around two gigawatts. So that means for this 200 to 300 gigawatt, we can like better start to uh, fill our plants now. Realistically, is that is that a, a, a goal that can be achieved? Yeah. It's definitely something we all want to achieve, of but can we do this? Of course, in, in but we definitely, what we addressed, like we raised our voice as mm -hmm. like an electrolyzer industry um, to the commission that, okay, these ambitions are great and like great to have like huge ambitions. Yeah. Um, but remember, like for producing these 10 million tons, you need a device called electrolyzer and these need to be produced. Mm -hmm. um, um, and we actually succeeded um, to get together, like the electrolyzer industry, with the European Commission. Okay. We signed a joint statement um, just two weeks before the Repower EU plan was, was published. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we signed a joint statement where we, as an electrolyzer industry, committed to um, increase our manufacturing capacities by 10 times. So, from like a rough the numbers in the document yeah. say from 1.75 gigawatt to 17.5 uh, gigawatt in 2025. Um, and that was at the Electrolyzer Summit where you all That was at the it. Electrolyzer mm -hmm. Summit where mm -hmm. we, with Commissioner Breton and a lot of CEOs from the uh, Electrolyzer industry, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. signed this joint uh, statement. Mm -hmm. So we committed mm -hmm. to a tenfold increase in manufacturing capacity, wow. but we said also, on the other hand, we need support for that. So we are... What support actually, do we, you actually we, need? We, we, we don't have the secured demand for that. Like it's a nice, it's like it's, it's, a, it's a good ambition, but this is not a demand documented with purchase orders, right? Mm -hmm. So we are actually taking a risk if we now 10 times increase our manufacturing capacity. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we need support for that. Uh, and we kind of demanded we need a dedicated um, budget for, let's say, funding of um, um, manufacturing capacities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and actually, two weeks later, in the Repower EU plan, uh, the European Commission um, directly implemented one measure with regards to that, so that was a success. Uh, they were talking about doubling the budget of the next a funding call of the ETS Innovation Fund. It's a huge uh, funding program of the European Commission, which is fed by uh, the emission trading system uh, benefits. Uh, is that the funding uh, for all renewables or specified on hydrogen? Uh, it's, it's actually covering all green technologies, uh, but it explicitly was like the budget was doubled uh, or will be doubled yeah. uh, because there will be an explicit uh, yeah, let's say focus yeah. on um, manufacturing of green technology, yeah. um, which also includes electrolysis. This is great news, though. That's that's yeah. one great news, one success. Yeah, yeah. Um, we would like to see More? that even improved, okay. but uh, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. uh, that was like also like a, a, a pragmatic step because mm -hmm. like the funding program is existing mm -hmm. and it's just. Mm -hmm setting like a priority in, mm -hmm. in an existing funding program that makes sense yeah. because it's always much more difficult to uh, come with a new pot of money like mm -hmm. a new actually line item in the budget mm -hmm. instead of using an existing funding program mm -hmm. uh, uh, for, for that. What do you think are the reasons why the regulatory framework has not been established yet? Or is uh, going in a more let's let's say it um, hesitant way. I think, as I said in the beginning, like uh, we, and that's a success of all of us, I guess. We succeeded to um, come to a like to, to an agreement that a green renewable hydrogen is, let's say, yeah, a, a must have. Uh, if we want to succeed uh, with with like decarbonizing all the sectors, I think that's common sense now, and that like leads to the fact. Okay, like if that's common sense, if we all agree we need that, 
we need a regulatory framework. And that's why, let's say, these things are, are on its way now. And you give an, and you give an outlook um, on the European, on Europe regarding renewables, but maybe specify on the hydrogen business um, in the next 10 years. Where do you think the market will develop? Good scenario and bad scenario. I, I actually, <laughs> I don't see a bad scenario, uh, basically. So I think we are at a point, and I'm in hydrogen now for around 20 years. So, and um, I'm kind of, I, I feel a, a, a little a relief because I, I think now it finally uh, starts. Um, we see it. Um, there's just like one perfect example, a perfect coincidence that the Nell booth is just across the Iberdrola booth. Um, and the stack that we exhibit at our booth, like the PEM uh, electrolyzer stack, um, actually 16 of those are in the um, green hydrogen production plant that Iberdrola is showing. So, and this is a real project. and. Uh, we didn't have these examples uh, three years ago when we came together last. Um, and this is just one example. And, and we also see like that finally, uh, we could, like the so-called, in the electrolyzer sector, the so-called feed studies, um, actually like the pre-engineering studies uh, of the large scale projects, they are taking off now. So mm -hmm. these are happening. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I'm, I, I really see it's finally market. taking off, yeah, and I don't yeah. want to talk about bad scenarios. Yeah, I, I understand that, um, and, and I definitely agree. And also, this fair is a really good indicator to measure how successful the hydrogen, now we can really call it business, is doing. We have been here since 1995 with seven or eight exhibitors. And this year, 2022, we are here with more than 200 exhibitors. Um, and we used to, this fair used to be called hydrogen fuel cells and batteries. There's no more space for batteries. Batteries are off because we need all the space for, um, for the hydrogen, for fuel cell companies, for electrolyzers, for testing equipment, for all um, our um, ambassadors, um, the um, German Hydrogen Association. So it, a lot has been growing. So we have exhibitors from more than 20 countries. So um, I think we're doing very successful and also like you said, there can only be good scenarios. I do want to wrap this up because yeah. I know I'm already over time, but this is a question I really want to know. Um, if you could make one wish, I know it's a little bit hypothetical, but if you could make one wish, what would you like to be changed in terms of um, a perspective from the political side? I'd actually, not, not, not necessarily change. Um, it's really... Um, sticking to the ambitious targets they are setting now. So um, I think that, that would be great. And that's also what we need. Um, for example, like one very important example I want to highlight is in the Renewable Energy Directive, there is a target for uh, green renewable hydrogen in the industry. And uh, the proposal of the commission in the Fit for 55 package was uh, is 50% renewable hydrogen in industry by 2030, which is it, which is huge. Um, and uh, if we succeed in like keeping that target and not watering it down with saying, I don't know, make it 30 green and 20 blue and uh, something like that. So stick to the ambitious targets, to the ambitious demand side targets, that would be great. And that would be the right signal. Uh, and also would give us, like as Nell, the confidence to invest in further manufacturing capacities. And then we can maybe already be happy with the funding we uh, have uh, uh, inside now. Yeah. I think, uh, and I'm, I think I'm speaking for everyone here, exhibitors, but also um, visitors, that we can only thank you for your work um, because it's so important that there is pressure um, on on the political side, but also that there is correct um, 
advising, right? So we want to go towards a hydrogen future, but we want to go towards a green hydrogen future. So that is something I really like to stress. And so I can only say thank you so much that you're here, that you're doing thank great you. work. And I'm pretty sure I will see you here next year. Uh, absolutely. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks.